Okay, so now we're being recorded and we're going to continue the P.4 section. So there's the problems there, but I'm gonna shoot the video over to my camera and I'm gonna stop sharing. Make sure you pin my video so that way you can see it um, large and it's not sitting in a little tiny, tiny um, window like everybody else's videos. Always make sure you pin me if you're gonna try to see what I'm doing on my paper, because I will toggle back and forth throughout every single class period between the um, PDF files with all the lesson slides and then um, back to the paper to start scribbling stuff down, okay? I don't like writing on the computer. It comes out really, really messy a lot of the time, okay? So that's why I prefer to just write it down on the paper and then I scan it and save that uploaded for you guys later too. Okay, so number five is the trinomial, and we know the steps for trinomials. It's one, first see if there's a greatest common factor. And then after that, after you've done that, if you can do that, then you go into the AC method, okay? Now, if you're awesome at factoring and you know how to factor that already, you already know the answer, because I can look at that and know the answer. If you're that type of person and you're at that skill level, that is perfectly okay just to write what the answer is. Um, you don't have to show the steps when it comes to the factoring. Um, your calculator that you'll be able to use cannot factor for you. So I know that if you factored it, that you did that on your own, okay? Um, so the answer is X minus eight, or I'm sorry, X minus nine times X plus eight. But how would we know that and how do we get there, right? I only show you guys one method because I don't like the guess and check kind of method. It takes too long, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to apply the AC method. So A times C. So that is an X squared times a negative 72, which gives me negative 72 X squared. Then I need to figure out how I'm going to add to get the middle guy B, which is negative invisible one X, right? Remember the X always has an invisible one coefficient and an invisible one exponent. Always, always, always. Okay, so remember the strategy. Go with the factors of the product. The one with the times, that's the number that you gotta break up. So I'm gonna take 72 and I'm gonna break up all these things. But how far down the list do I have to go, right? Take the square root of 72 to figure that out. Let me see, square root of 72 is, oh, that's weird. That's what's nice about this computer, this calculator, is if you do have to enter exact answers for your problems later, this will reduce your radicals for you. And so you can give um, your answers in exact form uh, real nice. You don't have to know how to break out a uh, square root of 72, okay? However, your calculator only does it so far. As long as the numbers are less than three digits, then it'll work. But when you start getting into the thousands, it doesn't work anymore, okay? It only goes up to hundreds. So hopefully you don't see that. If you do get a number like a thousand, um, there's a process to do it. And if we get there, I will explain it. I highly doubt it, rarely ever happens, okay? Um, but for this one, I don't want this because I don't know what number that is exactly. So there's a button down here. And if you notice right above it, it has an F and a little double arrow and a D, okay? That basically means from fraction to decimal or decimal to fraction. And it works the same way for square roots actually. So you just need to hit this double arrow button above the enter and it will toggle back and forth between decimal answer and exact answer, okay? Um, so if I hit that, notice that it's eight point something or another, right? So I don't care about the decimal part. All I care about is that number before the decimal and that tells me how far down this list I got to go. So then I start figuring it out. What is 72 divided by 1? 72. 72 divided by 2 is 36. 72 divided by 3 is 24. 72 divided by 4 is 18. 72 divided by 5 is not going to work, but I'll show you in the calculator. The fact that you get a decimal means that it doesn't go in there evenly. So this one does not work. 
72 divided by six is going to be 12. 72 divided by seven is a decimal, so this does not work. And then 72 divided by eight is that nine. Now, I already know that the eight and the nine is the one that's gonna work, but let's talk it out in case I didn't know that already, okay? Um, essentially what's happening is, is I'm going through this list in my mind and I'm already figuring out what the signs are gonna be so that I get these signs here. And that's how I could know that the answer was gonna be X minus nine and X plus eight, just by looking at that, okay? Because I'm doing all of this in my brain and the signs. And because there's no number in the front, I don't actually have to go through all the AC method because you'll notice what happens when there's no number in front. Um, you always end up with just X, X, and then the two magic numbers that you find for this step, okay? That's just a coincidence. It's something that happens every single time when there's no number in front. But when there is a number in front, you have no choice. Once you find those magic numbers, if you do, you have to do the grouping part here, okay? Here though, once I find the magic numbers, I could go straight to the answer. But I'm gonna do it the whole process. I'm gonna do the grouping step and everything just to show you that I'm not lying, right? <laughs> okay, so we've got eight and nine, but they need to multiply to give me a negative, which means one of these guys has to be negative so that I have a positive times a negative or vice versa, and it'll give me a negative. And then since when I combine them, that's what plus means, I combine them, depending on their signs, I will add, depending on their signs, I will subtract. But the plus means I will combine them. And I should be getting a negative one after I combine them, which tells me that the bigger number has to be negative. So that means all of the people in this column are going to be the negative numbers. And then you can tell, which one is the one that's gonna give me the negative one when I combine them as in adding, and that's going to be this pair right here, right? So now we know that this is going to be eight and negative nine, eight and negative nine. And then how are we gonna get these variables? Remember, in order for you to combine to get variables, you can only combine like terms, which means if this has an X, then both of these guys should have an X as well because I can't combine them unless they match, right? Unless they both have X with the same exponents, which means there has to be an X and an X up there too. So then just double check it. We've done all the logic, all the thinking part, double check it. Is eight X times negative nine X equal to negative 72 X squared? It is, so we're good there. And then is eight X plus negative nine X equal to negative one X or negative X. It is, so we've got the right breakdown, okay? So then you're going to use this makeup or this breakup to rewrite the negative one X. So essentially what's happening is that this term is going to become eight X and instead of plus a negative, you just put minus nine X. Now that eight was positive, so I actually need to use positive eight, and this 72 is still negative, okay? So all I did was find the magic numbers and use them to break out that middle number, okay? From there, we're gonna do our grouping. The left side actually has an X in common, and when I factor that X out, I get x plus eight, right? x times x is x squared, x times positive eight is positive eight x. Here, I have no choice, I have to bring down the minus. We already know that when you're talking about factoring, if there's a minus in the front, you have to factor that minus out, okay? And then what can both of those numbers be divided by? I do notice that here in my 72 chart, it can be divided by the whole nine, right? So you wanna factor out that whole nine. Yes, they can both be divided by three, but that wouldn't be the greatest common factor, okay? 
That would just be a common factor. And you always wanna factor out the greatest common factor. So then that means I have to take this and divide it by negative nine, which would give me a positive X. And then I have to take this and divide it by a negative nine, which actually gives me a positive eight. And then you'll notice that the two sides, and you can erase this to realize that it is all one problem, right? With two terms, this big term, and then that big term, and they both have this X plus eight in common. And so then if I were to factor that out, this would be gone and that would be gone. And I'd end up with X minus nine on the side of the other parentheses. And then are these the same? They are actually, right? It doesn't matter what order the parentheses are in, as long as what's inside those parentheses is exactly the same. So I have X plus eight here, I have X plus eight there, X minus nine here, X minus nine there. So these are equivalent to one another. So it doesn't matter whether you type this as your answer or whether you type that as your answer. Now, if you're super pro at factoring and you can go straight there, you do not need to do all of this, okay? You don't. But if you're not super pro, <laughs> then you have a whole process to follow, okay? So let's try the next one. Um, anyone can come off of mute, but does number six have a greatest common factor? Anybody want to say it again? Yes. What is the greatest common factor here? You don't have to answer it. Anybody can answer it. <laughs> Let's look at the numbers. I always like to separate it myself. We'll look at the numbers first and then the letters, okay? As far as the numbers are concerned, can three, two, and 16 all be divided by the same number? And if so, what is that number? Can they all be divided by two? Can three be divided by two evenly? No. No, I get a decimal, right? So these guys can be divided by two because they're even, but this one can't. And they cannot be divided by three either. These two guys cannot be divided by three. So that tells me that there's no number part of the greatest common factor. Now let's look at the letters. Can you factor out a letter, the X or X squared? No. No. Uh-huh, why? Because negative 16 doesn't have an X. Yes, you are right. And it's supposed to be in common with everybody, right? So there's no number to take out, no variables to take out. You could just write no GCF. There just isn't one, okay? You don't even have to write that, but I'm gonna write that just so that when someone's looking back at this, they know that we tried, but there's none, okay? Is this the part when we would use the uh, AC method? Yes, we do have to use AC method. And we especially have to use it because there's a number in the front. We can't just find the magic numbers and then give the answer. So notice here, just FYI, back to the same old one, notice that because there's no number in there, I'm gonna use X and X, and then this is a positive eight. So you put a positive eight in one of the parentheses, and this is a negative nine. So you put a negative nine in the other parentheses. So as long as there's no number in front here, you can skip all of this process, okay? You can just get the magic numbers and go here. This one though has a number in front, so I can't skip the whole grouping part. Okay, so I've got to go map it all out, right? A times C. What in the world is that? That is not one of the times tables I remember. So three times negative 16 is negative 48. And X squared with no nothing means I'm going to get X squared. And then the middle guy is minus 2X. 
Okay, so we're gonna break up the one with the times. That's the number that we're gonna break up. And how far down do I go on the number nine? So let's see, square root of 48. Oh, that's that weird square root stuff again. So I'm gonna hit that little double arrow. There we go, six point something. So we're gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six. And that will guarantee me that I have all the factors, okay? So 48 divided by one is 48. 48 divided by two is 24. 48 divided by three, now I know is 16. 48 divided by four is 12. 48 cannot be divided by five. When I try to do it, I get a decimal. And then 48, I don't, I think six is eight. Yeah, six times eight, okay? So this is all the factors. Oops, my camera. And it's supposed to be a negative 48, which means one of these columns is negative. And because my response for the second part is supposed to be negative, that tells me that the bigger numbers are going to be negative. Whatever sign this guy has is the sign of this right-hand column, the bigger side. If this were positive two, then all of these guys would have to be positive, making all of those guys negative because of the negative 48. Okay, now um, we need to figure, oh, go ahead, sorry. Uh, which one determines uh, which side is negative? This guy here, the B, the middle guy. Okay. He tells me what sign the right hand side is going to be. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. And then to figure out what the left hand is going to be, you have to look at the AC. So if that guy's negative, then these guys would be negative. But if this guy's positive, then these guys would be positive. But that's only after you look at this one first. Okay. We'll, we'll probably see more examples of it in just a little bit. Okay. So which one of these is gonna give me negative two? It looks like this one is the one that's gonna give me negative two when I combine. Six plus negative eight is gonna give me two, negative two. So I'm gonna have six X, six X, negative eight X, negative eight X. Just double check, is that product correct? And is that sum correct? So once we got that, we're going to split up this negative two X into positive six X and negative eight X, and then bring down the minus 16. We do our grouping. Um, you can physically draw the line or you can just imagine the line. I like to physically draw it. Okay, here's a good question. What is the GCF to the left of that line? Three X. Mm -hmm. They do both have an X and they both can be divided by three. So then three divided by three is just a one, which I don't write. And then X squared divided by X is X. Six divided by three is two and X divided by X will cancel. I am forced to bring down that minus. And these two guys can both be divided by what? The greatest thing they can both be divided by. Mm -hmm. So then this thing divided by negative eight means the negative eights will cancel, leaving me with X. And negative 16 divided by negative eight will give me a positive two. And if you have to put that in your calculator, negative 16 divided by negative eight, by all means, I'd rather you double check before just scribbling things on your paper, okay? I sometimes, and I know other people do it too, but I sometimes do stuff in my brain wrong. Um, it's just after seeing so many numbers, you just, your brain <laughs> doesn't work no more. And so sometimes I will jot silly things like that in my calculator, just because I wanna be sure that it's right before I keep going, okay? And there's nothing wrong with doing that. So I do have something in common on both sides. I have that X plus two in common. And then over here, I have the three X left over and the minus eight left over. Outside is the three X and outside is the negative eight. Okay, now notice that if I would have tried to do the shortcut and just say my answer is X and X, and then I have positive six here and negative eight there, 
When I FOIL this out, I will never get three X squared. I will only get one X squared, which is why you can't do this when there's a number in front, okay? If you don't want to have to consider when do I do the grouping and when do I not do the grouping, just do the grouping every single time, okay? I'm only showing you the shortcut for the ones that don't have the number in front in case you wanna save yourself some time and paper, okay? But you don't, you can do grouping every single time just so that you don't have to worry about when do I do it and when do I not do it. Okay, I am going to write down number seven and number eight on the next page. So number seven is this problem. And eight is this problem. Oh, let me go back to my camera so I can see. Okay, there we go. So that is what seven and eight look like. And for number seven, it does have three terms. So we have to first figure out if there's a GCF. And then if, if there is or if there isn't, doesn't matter. Um, but then I have to do the AC method. So the only thing that 25 can be divided by is five. And I can divide this guy by five, but I cannot divide this guy by five. So that immediately tells me that there is no GCF here because it has to be for everybody, all three, okay? Then I notice that this guy doesn't have an X, so I don't even have an X in common either. So there is literally no GCF here again. Three terms though means go to the AC method, right? So what times what equals, holy moly, 25 times positive nine is two, two, five, and then the X squared. So 25 X squared times positive nine is positive two, two, five X squared. And then at the bottom, we have negative 30x. So remember, the one with the times is the number we break up. And I think the square root of 225 is a nice number. It's 15. So unfortunately, I have to go all the way down to 15. This is the way you know you have every single possible um, combination of numbers, OK? And so, of course, it sucks because the bigger that number gets, the longer this list gets, right? But you want to make sure that before you tell me something is prime, that you actually had looked at all the possibilities, okay? So 225 divided by 1 is 225. 225 divided by 2 is a decimal. 225 divided by 3 is 75. I did not know that was going to go in. 225 divided by four is a decimal. 225 divided by five is 45. All the even numbers, this is not an even number. So all the even numbers are not gonna go into it evenly. So I already know, I mean, I can sit there and try to do them in my calculator, but I already know none of the even numbers are gonna work because this is not an even number, okay? But I do still need to try the odds because I really have no idea which of those odds are going to work. So 72 or 7 gave me a decimal. Oh, nine. Well, that's where I got the number from. 11 gave me a decimal. 13 gave me a decimal. And I think 15 is going to give me 15. Yeah. Okay, um, so this is all of them. You know, I tried them, but those are the only ones that work. And then remember we said that the bottom one is gonna tell me what the sign of this column is. So since that number is negative, the means this column is gonna be negative. And then this is what I was saying that the top number, that 225 X squared, that helps me figure out what signs go on the other side. Because if this side has to be negative, but the product has to be a positive, then that has to mean 
that these numbers need to be negative as well, because otherwise you won't have a positive when you multiply them, right? So they both need to be negative. So this one, pretty straightforward. They're all negative on the right-hand side. But then look at that guy to figure out, well, what would the sign need to be on the left side so that I get this number, okay? Okay, so which of those will give me negative 30? Oh, we do have a pair that will work. This pair right here. Remember, I'm gonna combine them. Negative 15 plus negative 15, which means um, I'm gonna get negative 30. So those are gonna be my two magic numbers. Negative 15 X, negative 15 X. And I'm gonna keep going. So do those add to give me negative 30? They do. Do those multiply to give me 225 positive x squared? They do. So we break this guy up. So negative 15x. And then instead of plus a negative, I'm just going to put minus 15x. It's too messy if you put in double signs. So I'm going to cut this in half. These can both be divided by five and they both have an X. So 25 divided by five is five, X squared divided by X is X. 15 divided by five is three and the X is gonna come out. This guy has to come down. These guys can both be actually divided by three, but it's a negative three outside this parentheses. So it's negative 15x divided by negative 3, which is a positive 5x. And then positive 9 divided by negative 3, which is a negative 3. If you're not sure if you did that step right, one, these two things should match. And two, when you distribute this, you should get those original two terms. Okay? So you can kind of check yourself midway. Okay? Then they both have the 5x minus 3 in common, which leaves me with that guy from the outside and this guy from the outside. And if the two parentheses are the exact same thing, then you can write 5x minus 3 squared. So I did not have to memorize that one formula that they gave me that said, if you have something like this, it's gonna be this. There is a formula like that. And there was another one with the minus sign. There were two formulas like that. And this one actually follows the bottom one because this is actually five X that's being squared. And this is three being squared. And if you'll notice five X times three is 15. But if I put a two in the middle, it fits the exact form. And so then my answer should have been the A without the square and the B. A is 5X and B is three. And there's a minus in the middle. But I didn't need to memorize those formulas. I didn't need to try to think if whether or not they matched the forms or not. I just did the same thing I've been doing for all the other trinomials and I still got the same answer, okay? So you do not have to memorize more formulas than you need to. You can just follow that AC method for any trinomial and you will get the correct answer. Okay, number eight, and I believe nine and 10 as well. Oh no, just eight and nine. Both of those, oh no, not even nine. Just this problem actually. It does not have three terms anymore. This is not two terms. This is one term. There's your variable and there's your coefficient for that variable. So there's only two terms. When there's only two terms, you factor out the GCF if there is one, and then you um, use one of the formulas that you're given, okay? And there's three formulas. So there's one with the squares, And then there's one with the cube and a minus sign. And then there's one with the cube and a plus sign. Which one of these cases do I have? Hmm. 
Anybody want to guess? Or if you know the answer, share it. Which case do I have? Do I have a minus, first of all, or a plus in the middle? Plus. Mm -hmm. So out of all these three, it has to be the bottom one, right? But if it were a minus, the next question I would ask myself is, do I have squares or do I have cubes? And it's obviously that this one's a cube, right? So this is the formula that I need to apply. Now, I like to write it differently. I like to write this as A times A, A times B, and B times B. It helps me better when I'm trying to fill in that second parentheses, okay? But first we need to figure out what the heck is A and what the heck is B, okay? So what in the world is being cubed here to give me that term? And what in the world is being cubed there to get the other term? And I first should have asked myself if there was a GCF, but this number can only be divided by five and 25. That's just something I know from experience. This number can only be divided by five, 25, and then of course the number itself, 125. But this number cannot be divided by any one of those three numbers. 729 does not end a five or a zero. Therefore, it's not going to be divisible by any of this guy's factors, okay? So there is no GCF. And I should have said that at the beginning, but as long as I didn't start factoring, we're good. You just don't wanna factor it and then later realize, oh no, I should have factored out GCF, okay? Okay, so let's see, 729, um, let me see, six times six times six, no, seven times seven times seven, eight times eight times eight, nine times nine times nine, ah, uh, there it is, it's nine. So nine cubed will give me the 729, and T cubed would of course give me T cubed. Here, I'm pretty sure that's five, but let me double check. Yes. So five times five times five is 125. So that means that my A is 9T and my B is five because that's what's inside those parentheses. So then what is my answer? It's gonna be A plus B. So 9T plus five, then A times A. 9T times 9T is 81T squared, but the minus from the formula, and then A times B. So 9T times five is 45T, then a plus sign, and then B times B, so five times five, which is 25. And that is the answer. Do not try to factor this trinomial when you use these two formulas. Because if that trinomial could have been factored, the formula would have already had them in factored form meaning you would have had three bubbles or three parentheses instead of one little one and then a trinomial, okay? So if this could ever be factored, it would have already shown you the pattern. But that guy cannot be factored, so don't even bother trying. You'll be wasting a lot of time just to realize that it's not going to factor, okay? So if you take out the GCF at the beginning like you're supposed to, and then you apply this formula, you know that that trinomial is not gonna go anywhere, okay? So let's see what number nine and number 10 are gonna look like. So number nine is this problem. And number 10 is this problem. Okay, so for number nine, it is a trinomial. So I do need to see if I have a GCF, okay? Now this one is super tricky. So I'm glad it's in here because it is very tricky. Seven can only be divided by seven. And these numbers cannot be divided by seven. So there is no number GCF, a number part for the GCF. And this guy doesn't have the variable, the y. 
So there's no variable part of the GCF. So one would be inclined to say here that there is no GCF. However, I mentioned to you, if the front guy is negative, you have to factor out that, that negative. So I have no choice, but I have to factor out that negative, okay? And so a negative times what is going to give me a negative? A negative times a positive will give me this negative. A negative times a what will give me a negative. A negative times a positive will give me a negative. And then a negative times what will give me a positive? A negative times a negative would give me a positive. So basically, if you have to factor out a negative, notice how all the signs change, right? Because when I multiply that negative back in, they're all going to change back, OK? So this one does, you would not say no GCF here, OK? And if you want it to be super cool, you know that there's an invisible one there. So negative one times this is this. Negative one times that is that. But we don't ever write the invisible ones. So you can just say you factored out a negative. And that's OK. But I still have three terms inside that parentheses. So I do still need to go check the AC method and see if that can keep factoring. So I would go this times this. Oh gosh, seven times negative 16 is negative one, one, two. And then the middle guy is positive 24y. So one, one, two is the guy I'm gonna break up. And let me hit the double arrow, it's 10. So the square root of one, one, two was 10 point something. So I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this is one, one, two, one, one, two divided by two. One, one, two divided by three, no. One, one, two divided by four. One, one, two divided by five, no, it doesn't end in a five or zero. So I should have known better. Nope. Oh, seven worked. I would not have thought that. Bear with me. I'm trying to get all these numbers to see which ones work. And then it doesn't end in a zero, so I know that 10 is not going to go into it. OK, so those are our pairs. Remember, this guy tells me the sign of this column. So since that's positive, that means all of these are going to be positive. And then we look at what we're supposed to get when we multiply. Since we need to get a negative when we multiply, a positive times a negative will give me a negative, which tells me that these guys should be negative. And then which of those would actually combine to give me 24? That would actually be this one. When I combine those, I will get positive 24. So I'm just gonna break it up right away. I'm not even gonna go fill in the boxes. The less I have to write, the better, okay? So I'm gonna leave this alone. I know that that will be in my final answer. I just need to figure out what's supposed to go in the two parentheses, okay? So I'm gonna write down seven y squared, and then the two numbers I found would be negative four y and positive 28 y. So that when I combine these y's together, I get positive 12, 24 y. And then if I imagine I'm chopping that in half, this side has a Y in common. I have to bring down the plus sign and this side can be divided by four. And the positive and positive will give me positive, negative and positive will give me negative. And they should match. And when they do, you factor that out and left over I have Y and plus four. So it should go a little bit faster as you get more and more practice with it, okay? And this is my final answer. Don't forget to write your GCF from the very, very beginning in your final answer. It happens a lot. 
people start working on this and then they'll tell me that that's the answer, but they forgot about the GCF, it should go in front, okay? The next one is already four terms. So I don't need to go through all of the AC method part because it pretty much has already been done for me. All I have to do is chop it in half and then factor. So if we were to imagine chopping that in half, what does the left side have in common? X squared. Mm -hmm. Not just X, right? But you have at least two here and you have two there to always go with the lower exponent between the two guys. So x squared is correct. Ooh, what do I get when I do x squared divided by x squared? What do you get when you divide any, but any number by itself? You get one, so then it'd be x, wouldn't it? Not x, but it would be one. Oh, geez. Because if you put an X here, what happens when you do X squared times X? You get X cubed, right? And that's not what I have here. So always remember when you distribute this, it has to give you back these two guys. So X squared times four X is four X cubed and X squared times one is this X squared with the invisible one, right? I had to bring that up because that's a common thing that happens. Okay, or I get people that don't put anything because they're like, oh, x squared and x squared cancel. So this is all I have. But if that's all I had, how am I going to get two terms, right? So you do have to have something over here. Okay, the other side is a little bit more what we're used to. These guys can both be divided by seven. So a negative and a negative is positive, negative and a negative is positive. 7 divided by 7 is 1. Anything divided by itself is 1. The two parentheses do match, and that leaves me with x squared minus 7. Now, I would ask myself, does this fit one of those formulas? But it doesn't, because this is not a perfect square. Now, had that been a 4 or... Uh, what else, a nine or a 16 or a 25, but a perfect square number, then I would have had to factor this, this factor here even more. But because this is not a perfect square, it does not fit the formula. And so then I am truly done with this problem. Okay, so those are all of the examples that we hadn't covered last class which is why I had scheduled on the schedule for two class periods for this section, because I knew we were gonna need that time um, to go through all of the problems, okay? We got through all of the, the lesson part and we got through most of, or almost half of the examples, but we really wanted to get the other half today. So I am gonna go ahead and share my screen again. Let me... And I'm gonna continue in this unit with the 1.4 section. So remember, our objective is just to cover the quadratics equations by factoring. That's the only way we're gonna solve equations in this section, okay? So a quadratic equation is always gonna be of this form where you have some, num some certain number of x squareds, a certain number of x's and a certain number of constants, okay? However, it can still be a quadratic equation even if you don't have these two terms. The only thing that makes it quadratic is this x squared, okay? So that's why they say down here that the a cannot equal zero because if the a is equal to zero, then you don't have any x squareds and then it's not a quadratic anymore, okay? We don't care if it has x's and we don't care if it has constants to be considered a quadratic. All we care is that it has an x squared if x squared is the highest exponent there, then it is considered a quadratic, okay? And here's where they talk about, this is actually one of the questions in the homework. So what are all the methods of solving equations? There's, there's these are more like the same thing, um, but it says completing the square is its own other thing, but it's not. You have to actually complete the square 
so that you can extract roots and that we will talk about, you know, sometime next week. Okay. But really there's only three methods and that's factoring, extracting roots, and then doing the quadratic formula. So those are the three methods that we use to solve quadratic equations. Completing the square is just the process we need to do this method. Kind of like AC method is the process that we use to do this method, okay? Because this is a trinomial, is it not? And we already know if we have a trinomial, we've got to do the AC method, okay? If one of these guys is missing, whether this term or this term is missing, then you don't have a trinomial and then you don't have to do AC method, okay? So I'm pretty sure that's gonna happen in our examples or in our practice problems. So we'll just um, talk through that as we get there, okay? So the property that allows us to solve um, quadratic equations by factoring is called the zero factor property. So if you can factor something into two factors, the zero factor property basically says that either the A has to be zero or the B has to be zero so that if you multiply them together, you're ending up with zero, right? That only makes sense. And you solve each of those individual factors equal to zero. You solve this equation and this equation to get all of your solutions, okay? So here's an example of what they're talking about. Here they have this quadratic equation and it is a quadratic because the highest exponent in the whole equation is an x squared, okay? But in order for me to solve it by factoring, it has to equal zero, okay? So they subtract three on both sides so that the right-hand side will become a zero. And seven minus three is where this four came from, okay? Then they factored and they act like that was so easy to factor. But we know that there's a whole process behind trying to factor this thing, right? That's the whole AC method. Except now in this problem, the AC method is really gonna become my side work. And then I'm only gonna put the, the factors in my solution. I'll show you what I mean when I map it out on paper, okay? But they did a bunch of work to factor that. And this is what they ended up with when they factored it. So the equation becomes those factors equal to zero. And then according to that zero factor property, either this factor equals zero or this factor equals zero. So you set each one equal to zero. Here they set the first one equal to zero and here they set the second parentheses equal to zero. And then if you minus one and then divide by two, you get this solution um, x equal to negative one half. And then if you minus four on both sides of the other equation, you get X equal to negative four, okay? So there's two solutions, um, X equal to negative one half and X equal to negative four. And you can check your answer still. So throughout this whole test, you can check every single one of your answers. So you'll know, granted that you're checking it correctly, but you should know whether or not you have the right answers. And so therefore you should know whether or not you're gonna get hundred, okay? Um, but you should have all the answers. So what they do, this is a whole nother equation, but I'm gonna show you how to check the answer. What you wanna do is you wanna go to the original equation. Always go to the original equation to type this stuff in there, okay? Now I am gonna show you on paper, what I'm gonna type in my calculator. So let me write this equation down real quick. So the solutions we found are x equal to negative one half and x equal to negative four. So let me stop sharing so you can see my screen. So I've written down that original equation. And this is how you check it. So I first have to check them one at a time. So right now I'm gonna check X equal to negative one half. What you're doing is you're plugging in negative one half everywhere you see an X. 
And then you want to see, is this actually equivalent? Does the left side actually equal the right side? And so you can rely on your calculator a lot here. I'm going to show you how to type this in there. Oh, it's better on this side. Yeah, much better. Okay, so if I hit clear, I'm going to type in two parentheses negative, and then there's a fraction button right here above the seven. I'm going to hit that. I'm going to hit one, and I'm going to hit the down arrow to go downstairs. Hit two. Notice how it's blinking a little right arrow because I need to hit right to get out from underneath that denominator. Close the parentheses, hit the squared button right there, plus nine, open, oops, I forgot the nine. Open parentheses, negative fraction one over two, close it, plus seven. So I could enter the whole thing in my calculator, which is nice. What did I do? It says error. Oh, I forgot to delete the extra parentheses. There we go. And I do get three. Mm -hmm. So this one does check out. Then you also want to check your other solution. So this time you're going to plug in negative four everywhere. Now, I don't typically check my answers just because I'm pretty confident that I've done all my steps correctly. But if you are feeling unconfident, check your answers to make sure that they're good. Okay. So two parentheses, negative four, close with the square plus nine parentheses, negative four, close the parentheses, plus seven. And I also get three. So it does work. Both of them are solutions. Now, um, in the computer, in the computer, it may ask you to give them both of the answers and it may just have a blank and you type in negative one half as a fraction and then comma, and then the second um, value. So that's how you enter in WebAssign. You would use their little palette to type in a fraction, but you would have to type in negative one half and then comma and then the negative four because both of them are actually solutions. Ah, look, there's two terms here. I knew that was gonna happen. Whenever there's two terms, you still have to get it equal to zero and you still have to factor it, okay? So these two guys do have a factor in common. They have three and X in common. So then if I factor out the three X, you end up with the two X minus one. And once it's all factored, you set each factor equal to zero. So they've set the three X equal to zero and the two X minus one equal to zero, okay? When you divide by three on both sides of this equation, you do get X equals zero. When you solve this equation, you do get positive one half. So our two solutions are zero and one half, okay? And then you can check those by plugging in zero here, zero and zero here, and then seeing if all of that works out to equal zero, okay? And you could do the same thing with the one half. So you can check your answers, okay? Um, notice that it's called the zero factor property because it only applies to equations that have zero on one of the sides of the equation. Normally the right-hand side, but not necessarily, okay? So as long as the whole thing is equal to zero, you can apply it. If you try to do it to problems that don't have zero, it's not going to work. You're going to get the wrong answers, okay? So if you do have a problem that is given to you like this, then you've got work to do. So if that's the problem that they give you to solve, you have to get it equal to zero, which means you are gonna have to multiply these binomials out and then eventually subtract eight on both sides so that you can get the polynomial equal to zero, okay? Um, so we're gonna jump into the practices and we're gonna start seeing how many do we have in practice? We just have one, one to practice. You'll have more in your homework, but <laughs> they're all pretty much work the same. You have to get it equal to zero, you have to factor it, and then you have to set each factor equal to zero. So let me stop sharing and let me write this problem down.
x squared plus 4x equal to negative 4. So I'm going to show you the steps. So step one is um, get equation in what they call general form. And that's where it looks like this. Sometimes people say standard form. It's the same thing, okay? Actually, no, standard form is something totally different, but we're not gonna learn about it until we get to um, completing the square, okay? But this is called the general form of the equation. So you have to make it look like this. Now, this guy may be missing or that guy may be missing, but what's important is that it's equal to zero and that it's in descending order, okay? It has to be like that in order for you to continue. Then the second thing you're gonna do is you're gonna actually factor it. And then the third thing you're gonna do is set each factor equal to zero and solve for X in, those, in both of those equations, right? Um, and then four is optional. You can check I don't typically check, but you can. And I would if I were taking my own test, right? I would be checking my answers just to make sure. Okay, so first thing is to get it to look like this. Notice that there's nothing, no parentheses over here. I don't need to multiply anything together, but I do need to get it equal to zero. So I'm gonna add four to both sides so that now I have zero over here. And none of these three things are like terms. So I'm just gonna write it in descending order, which means x squared first, then the x's, then those constants. And then here, I'm gonna go factor it. And so this is what I was talking about when I do the side work. This is my AC method, and this is gonna be my side work. So I always like put a little squiggles around it just so that it's separated from the rest of the problem. Because all I wanna do here is just write the answer equal to zero. Okay, this is what you're doing just to figure out that second step. Okay, if you can factor it nice, you know, real fast, then go for it because that's fine if you know the answer. Okay, but if you don't, you have a method to revert to. So I would do what times what equals x squared times positive four, positive four x squared. And then the middle guy is 4x. Now I know that the square root of four is two. So when I break up this four here, I'm gonna have one and two, which is four and two. How is this gonna give me four? Only with this pair, right? Remember this number is positive. So it tells me that the right-hand side is positive, but this number is also positive. And so a positive times a positive will give me that positive. So I do not need to put negatives in this problem at all. So then I know that from those terms, that 4x is going to break up into a positive 2x and a positive 2x, right? Because those together are using the magic numbers. But when I combine them, I get that 4x. And then when I cut this in half, I factor out the x here, bring down the plus factor out the two there, and I get x plus two and x plus two, okay? Or you could have done a shortcut because there's no number in the front. Once you get those two magic numbers and you know their signs, you just put x, x, and then positive two and positive two, okay? Now, this can be written like this. Right, because it's exactly the same thing. And that's the definition of a square. When you multiply something times itself, you get it the same thing squared, okay? But then how do I set that? There's really only one thing to set equal to zero. And so how do I solve this equation when I have it set equal to zero? How do you undo a square? Does anybody know what's the opposite operation of squaring? Square root. Mm -hmm. So we have to do the square root on both sides. And so uh, then, go ahead. 
and we have to do or sorry we have to do the square root to get if the answer you, to the if problem? you wrote this as a square yes oh if you did not write this as a square you could set that guy equal to zero and then this guy equal to zero so then the uh currently x plus two in parentheses parentheses is the answer this is the factored version of the equation it is not the answer okay oh i was lost there my bad we're just at step two so oh. right now we just went from here to here using all this mess right so we're at step two, we factored it. Now I'm trying to set each factor equal to zero and solve. Now I had two choices. I could have set these two factors equal to zero and solve them. But because I noticed that these were the same thing, I decided to rewrite it as a square. And so then now I only have one factor that I need to set equal to zero. And so that's what I'm doing now. Yes, ma'am. Either way, you'll get the same answer. Because I could have done this, or I could have just done x plus 2 equal to 0, and then x plus 2 equal to 0. But that's the same equation, isn't it? So for this top one, I'm going to get x equal to negative 2. And for the bottom, I'm going to get x equal to negative 2. So negative 2 is the only answer here. If I would have gone from that line straight to solving each one equal to 0. Okay, but I didn't. I chose to notice that they were the same and put a square. So now I have to solve this equation. And to do that, you do have to do the square root on both sides. That square root will undo this square. And so I no longer need the parentheses. And square root of zero is zero. Normally, when you take the square root of something, you do get plus or minus, but zero is neutral. It's not plus and it's not minus. So you don't need a sign on zero. Positive zero and negative zero are exactly the same thing. Okay. And then if I solve this equation, just like those, I get X equal to negative two. And so negative two is the answer. So like I said, whichever way you do the problem, you're still going to get the same answer. If you just want to factor and then set each factor equal to zero, perfectly okay to do. If you are like me, I'm a little bit more formal. So when I see they're the same, my brain automatically wants to put a square. And if you do that, it's okay. You'll still get the same answer. So that's what's weird about mathematics is that there are rules, but essentially you can do whatever you want as long as you're not breaking any of the rules. And so that's what gets confusing about mathematics is because one person may do it one way and another may, person may do it another way and both of them are doing it correctly. Um, it's just a matter of choice. What, you know, did they choose to do this or did they choose to do that? So it makes it a little bit um, more complicated as a learner, I think. As an instructor, I've already learned how to manage it. I know <laughs> all the possible ways you could do it. And so I, I'm pretty sure I'll be able to grade your papers and I don't dock points if you don't do it the way I do it, okay? As long as you're not breaking any rules, you get your full credit on your problems. Now, if you start doing weird stuff that doesn't really have a rule behind it that says you can do that, that's the things that I would have to dock points for. And then I would explain to you, hey, there's no rule that says you could do this or this, okay? Okay, and sometimes I see some really cool things when I get to those tests. I mean, people just be doing some real cool methods that I never would have even thought of, um, especially people from other countries because they learn math differently in other countries. And so then when they show their methods on their paper, I can follow them, but I just look at them and I'm like, wow, I would have never, I've never seen that method before. And I would have never thought to do that because I've never been taught um, that particular method. But let me go ahead and share my screen again, just so that I can reiterate. And then I may go into WebAssign and look at that. Um, homework. So I'm going to go back. I'm hoping that it will close it. Yeah, it did. 
And then I'm gonna go over here where it says home. And then, and you can click here for this book. We don't really use this book. It came with the other book that we selected, um, but all your homework and all the lessons that we do, it's all on here. It's just, we're starting with the P sections. Um, I think they're called prerequisite chapter. So we're still working on the prerequisite chapters because we're still doing the intermediate algebra, not the college algebra yet, okay? Uh, when we get to the one, chapter one, then we're starting to get to the higher end of the intermediate algebra. But once we get to chapter two, that's where the real college algebra begins, okay? And so you'll notice that we're not really, I know the way they separate the topics is based on the state. And so you might see, you know, some chapter ones in there. And then here, there's some more chapter ones. And then here's, there's some more P and more chapter ones, okay? But the real college algebra starts at chapter two. Now, our first unit for college algebra is usually these two things, just because y'all haven't seen circles yet. And we kind of have to talk about the coordinate system before we can talk about circles, okay? So those are something that we normally begin our normal uh, college algebra classes with, which is why it's there. And it's kind of in between two of the intermediate um, level units because it just made sense to put it there. <laughs> if you follow the flow of what you're learning, it makes sense for it to be here. Because once we start learning how to um, fact complete the square, then you can do circles. And once you start learning about complex numbers, you can do circles, okay? So it just made sense to put it there. So I apologize if it looks a little weird. <laughs> the fact that unit one and unit two for college algebra are stuck in the middle of the remedial part. But like I said, this timeline was created with what we call just in time um, concepts. So you're gonna learn things so that they flow nicely, not let's learn this and then go jump to that and then go jump back to this, you know what I mean? <laughs> it causes a little bit more confusion when you start toggling around like that. So we just try to organize them so that the flow of your learning makes more sense, okay? But on paper, it looks funny because you have, you know, college units stuck in the middle of remedial units, okay? Um, but I will keep those grades separate. You do have a Canvas class over here for the 314, and you have the College Algebra class for the 1414. So in here, I will place all your test grades and all your homework averages just so that you have an actual intermediate algebra grade. Um, and then if you go, you can't go to it. You might find a backdoor way to it. But if you do find the assignment page, um, you'll notice that I, I think I have put all of the 13, all of the, um, oh, I haven't done it yet. So eventually I will, I will group all of the 314 unit stuff in one unit and that unit will be worth 0% of your grade. And then when we get to the college algebra stuff, those will count as your college algebra grades, okay? But we haven't gotten there yet, so I haven't put it um, in. Right now it's just all separated. If you go look, just FYI, I build the online course first and then we go to that same calendar in this class. So if you were to go to my, you can't go to my online class, but I just wanna show you. Um, in my online class, I do have all of the stuff in here. And so notice that I have all the assignments for the whole semester in there, okay? I will migrate them over to our class when we get there, or this weekend, I'm gonna migrate a lot of stuff. But notice that this whole 314 is 0% of the grade, right? All of the orientation stuff was just stuff that I needed you to do so that you're ready for Monday, but it's not worth any part of your grade. So don't worry, like if, oh, I did horrible on the readiness quiz, I don't care. The only point of that readiness quiz was just for me to kind of see where you are and then make sure that you know how to take a test. That's the only purpose of it, okay? It didn't matter if you failed it or if you aced it. Um, I just wanted to see where everyone was. Then, um, 
all of the 1414 web assign assignments are part of this college algebra grade. Then if I keep going, um, all of the 314 unit tests are 0%. All of the 1414 unit tests are 65%, just like it says in the syllabus, right? And then eventually I'll put the final exam in there and that will be 20%, okay? So I just want you to be aware that it will, the grades will match in your grade books uh, once we start taking some of those tests, okay? Um, so hopefully that helped. If not, watch the replay <laughs> and maybe that'll help make a little bit more sense if you hear it a second time, okay? As soon as we get everybody with the orientation, I will move it down. And then before you leave here today, just be aware that when you get to see unit A, you can go over the timeline and the to-do list. You can go download the workbook and print it if you want to. You can rewatch all of our lectures here. And then you can go attempt the three homework assignments for this unit and the review for this unit. All of these need to be done before class. These four things in WebAssign need to be done before class on Monday. So that way, when I see you on Monday, you can ask all your questions and then go take that test, okay? But I wanna make sure you have all your answers before you go try to take the test. You will not get a, um, I don't know how much it's gonna show me. I'm gonna show a preview of this, but I hope it doesn't give you the first problem. No, it doesn't, okay, good. So when you go into the test, it's got all the directions there. And then if there's information that I think you're going to need, you will have it. So notice that the difference of squares and the sum and difference of cubes, they're all here. I do have the perfect square trinomial formulas in there in case anyone liked them. I don't, I just do AC method and I'll get the same answer, right? We've done that twice today. Um, so I don't memorize this perfect square trinomial uh, formula stuff, all of this, I don't do that, but, but it's there. All your formulas will be on the test. And you'll note, I don't wanna scroll down too far because I don't wanna give you away the questions, right? Um, but if you notice the formulas are up at the top and you just scroll down to get to your answers, I mean, to your problems. And then if at any point you wanna scroll back up to the note sheet, you can scroll back up to the note sheet while taking that test, okay? So I just wanted to point, point that out. It does tell you the rubric, how I'm grading every single problem. So all the problems, there's only 10. So all 10 questions um, are going to be worth 10 points each. If you select the correct answer, that will be worth one point. If you do not select the correct answer, you will be deducted a point, okay? So you could have had all your work perfectly correct, but then you, for some reason, didn't like see the correct choice and you clicked the wrong one. Um, you do get a point deducted, okay? And your work does have to match whatever you select, okay? Sometimes I have people that do the work and it doesn't match any of the answers. And so then they just pick one that kind of looks like theirs. And that would be the situation where you might get that point docked, okay? Notation is important. Are you writing things properly? Are you writing them nice and neat? Are you explaining to me what you're doing or are you writing down a bunch of chicken scratch, okay? so the way you write things matters, okay? So your notation and how you write everything is worth two points. That, think about that though. This is how important it is, okay? Because if it's two points for every single problem, that's 20 points of your grade based on how you're writing things, okay? So make sure that you're able to write things properly. Try to follow the flow that the way I write them I'm not saying you have to write things the way I write them. You just have to write them nice and neat and they have to follow the flow of your solution. Whatever that flow is for you, it has to follow that flow, okay? So if you're doing side work, go do the squigglies on the side and do your side work over there and then come back to the problem and keep that main flow, okay? If it's pretty much correct, right? Where I can tell what you're trying to say, but it just looks a little messy. I will still give you a point. But then if it's just a bunch of chicken scratch, I can't <laughs> award you points for notation on that, okay? And if you want me to look at your work and see 
if you know how to write things correctly or not. When you do the review, write down the solutions to that review the way you intend to write down your solutions for the test and then send me a picture of your solutions for the review. If I see how you're writing stuff down for the review, then I can explain to you like, oh, that's great. Or, you know, no, this is just a bunch of numbers all over the place. I don't understand what you're trying to say. Okay. And I can give you that feedback. Um, and that goes for both classes, whether we're in the face-to-face -face or if you're in the online class, just send me a, uh, a picture of your, you could do it from text, send me a picture of your paperwork for the review, and I can let you know whether or not you are writing things the correct way. It sounds silly now, but when you get to calculus, the madness just piles and piles, and I, you cannot afford to be writing chicken scratch when you get to calculus. No one will be able to give you any points because they won't understand what you're trying to say. So the solution itself is worth 70 po seven points or 70% of your grade. If you just have like one tiny arithmetic error in there, then you'll get only one point dot for your explanation. Excuse me, I have the hiccups now all of a sudden. Um, if you have multiple arithmetic errors, you'll get two points dot. You know, hopefully it doesn't happen multiple times because then that shows that you're having a problem with arithmetic, um, but you can still get the majority of the college algebra points if you're still able to uh, explain what you're trying to do, okay? If there's a minor conceptual error, I do take off four points, which is almost like a little bit more than half of the explanation points. And if there's a major conceptual error, like it's obvious you have no idea what's going on, I will give you a point if you've shown something, right? If you, you're trying, <laughs> You just don't understand what to do. But if there's no work at all for a problem, all you have is the problem and the answer. Um, those are the kinds of problems where I put zero points. Now, with that said, there are sometimes certain problems on the test where it can be done without writing anything down, okay? And for those particular problems, um, I will write in the directions, no work needed. And if there's a problem like that on the test that there's no work needs to be written down, you basically get all the points for selecting the correct answer. So all 10 points would be, did you, collect, did you select the correct answer or not? Okay, I just wanna make you aware of that. Um, and then this is just a reminder so that you know while you're taking the test, how your paper should look. And then you have it in the back of your mind that you are gonna have to upload this when you're done. I don't want anybody forgetting that they need to upload it when they're done because then you just get a zero on the test. And that's again, for test security reasons. If you never upload it, how do I know what you have on your paper that you finally turn in was what you did when you were taking the test, right? That's why I have that 30 minute block so that I know that you took your test and then you gave me your paperwork right away. You didn't sit there and try to correct anything or make any changes. It's just like in a classroom where you finish your test and you turn in your paperwork, okay? Okay, so does everybody understand? I think we're all good. We're finishing a little bit early. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but, where is this guy? I just wanted to show you because we only did one practice problem from 1.4. I just wanted you to see what 1.4 homework looks like. So it's a few problems, a few like concept questions, okay? Um, and then after that, you start with the problems. So there, there's only two terms. So it would be like the um, example that was in the lecture notes where they just factored out the GCF and then set each one equal to zero. Same thing here, it only has two terms. So factor out the GCF, then set each factor equal to zero. This one needs to be rearranged before you can factor out the GCF and then do the um, AC method. This one is good to go and coincidentally it matches the example that I just did but notice the numbers in red. That means when you see the problem, it's probably going to randomize those two numbers, okay? So you may not get the same exact problem that we did in class today, like I am getting for number seven, okay? 
This one's already in the nice, perfect form. You just have to do the AC method to factor it and then set each factor equal to zero. Same thing here. You're gonna have to do the AC method. This one, this one's tricky, but it can be done because that one's actually the difference of two squares. So factor it using the difference of two squares and then set each factor equal to zero. Here, AC method, and then each factor equal to zero. This one is not ready yet. You have to move over the 14 first, then factor, then set your factors equal to zero. And this one has a fraction in it. I'm gonna write that one down. I'm not gonna do the whole problem unless somebody really wants me to, but I'll just do it quickly. Um, because there is a way to get rid of fractions, okay? So let me stop sharing. And I wrote down that problem. So this is the 1.4 homework, number 13. Now remember, there was numbers in red, so you might not get the same numbers that I do, okay? But you need to know the process in case one of these things is on the review. And of course, if one of these things is on the test, right? You can always get rid of fractions by multiplying every single term in the equation by the common denominator. And since there's only one denominator in this whole problem, that's going to be what I multiply everybody by. So I'm gonna multiply everybody on both sides by this nine. And what happens here is those cancel and I get one X squared. Here I get negative nine X and here I get who knows what, I think 162, let me see. Um, nine times 18, yes. And then nine times zero is zero. And so then now you're dealing with this problem here and you wanna to try to factor it, go through the AC method if you need to. Um, I'm pretty sure that this is going to be the answer. And then you set this factor equal to zero. And then you set this factor equal to zero and you solve this one and you solve this one. And then those are your two answers. Okay, so like I said, I went through that really, really fast because I didn't show all of the AC method part, okay? But from here to here, you probably wanna be doing the AC method if you're not a pro at factoring. If you are a pro at factoring, then you can just write down the factors and keep going, okay? So this is what I mean by the flow. Um, even if you didn't write the times nine, times nine, times nine, times nine in red, if you just went from here to here, I know what's happening. I know what you did, and I know whether or not you did it correctly. And if you did go from here to here and you made a mistake, I can tell you how or why you made, or you know what the mistake was. Then if you go from here to here, I can tell you, hey, you didn't do this right, or maybe you just guessed because I don't see your AC method worked out, um, but this isn't correct, you know? And I can keep guiding you like that throughout the um, course, but I need to see all of those steps. If you're the type of person that has to put plus 18 and plus 18 before you get to this line, that's perfectly okay. If you can do it without doing that, that's perfectly okay too. I even have some people go X minus 18 equal to zero in their brain and just tell me that the answer is positive 18. So they totally skip this line that I wrote down and they just tell me that X equals negative nine and X equals 18. That's okay. There are places where you can skip steps and it doesn't need to look exactly the way that it looks when I write it, okay? But I do need to see where things are coming from. You could not go straight from here to here, okay? I will know that, I mean, I couldn't even do that. I couldn't just look at this problem at the top and tell you what the answer is. And I've factored gobs and gobs of things, right? So you do have to show something how you're finding these solutions, okay? Okay, well, that is it. We did finish probably about nine minutes early. I do need um, Jalen and uh, Shyla, I believe it was, to stay back just so that I, and Elias to stay back so I can make sure that you guys get your web assigned good. Everyone else, y'all already did the getting started web assign assignment and you did great. And then some of you have already started working on the um, 
homework sections for this unit. Homework one, two, and now you can do three, okay? Um, so make sure you work on those over the weekend. If you have any questions between now and Monday, please text me or message me in that remind or respond to that email messages where I'm sending you all the announcements um, and I will get your message, okay? You can also email me in ACES or you can email me in Canvas, but I don't want you in the dark about anything um, over the weekend. So if you have questions, ask, okay? Other than that, the rest of you outside those three people, you are free to go, you have a great day and I will be here for the other three. Somebody asked, do we do the unit review this weekend? Yes. You want to have it done before class on Monday. But other than that, bye, guys. Bye, Miss. Thank you. Bye, Miss. Bye, Miss. Okay, I'm going to stop recording. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have a good weekend.